What we're going to do now is start talking about non-concurrent versus concurrent collectors. And we've talked a bit about the fact that there are two different types of collectors, but I haven't really explained in much detail how they differ. And we'll see that the main way that they differ has to do with the mutable result container. And in the case of concurrent collectors, there'll be one mutable result container that has to be concurrent and synchronized, whereas for non-concurrent collectors, you don't have just one, and it doesn't need to be synchronized. So let's first talk about concurrent, or sorry, non-concurrent collectors, but we'll first give an overview of what a collector is. So a collector is an interface that can be implemented to accumulate input elements into something called a mutable result container. Key, key point is mutable. It can be changed, unlike reduce, which can't be changed. Collector implementations can have characteristics that give them properties that are then used by the streams framework in order to figure out how to run them correctly. And there's a bunch of different characteristics. There's something called whether something's unordered or not, something is identity finish or not, and something that makes the collector concurrent or not. And we're going to be focusing primarily on concurrent, although we'll talk about the other characteristics as well. The distinction between concurrent and non-concurrent collectors is really only relevant for parallel streams. We don't care for non-parallel streams because there's only one thread of control. Interestingly enough, as I mentioned several times before, a non-concurrent collector can be used for either a sequential or a parallel stream. At this point, we're going to focus on parallel streams to dem demonstrate the differences between the two. So let's start off by talking about the structure and functionality of non-concurrent collectors. So a non-concurrent collector works by merging together sub-results that are being processed in multiple threads in the common fork joint pool in a parallel stream. So recall the phases. Again, just a quick recap. Input is partitioned into chunks by splitterators. Each chunk then runs in parallel in the common fork join pool. And then the sub-results for a non-concurrent collector are collected into an intermediate mutable result container, which is typically something like a list, or a set, or a map, or whatnot. And in this case, for the non-concurrent collectors, different threads in the common fork join pool will operate on different instances of intermediate result containers as they get merged back together to have the final reduced result. So you have a final reduced result in the final mutable result container. But there could have been multiple mutable result containers intermediately along the way as that reduction process takes place. Again, quick recap, only one thread is ever used to merge things together while the processing takes place. So you never have to worry about synchronization. So one of the nice things about this approach is it's order preserving. So, you, for example, you can have things that will in, preserve in counter order. But it's relatively costly for containers like maps and sets, where merging things together is expensive. In contrast, merging two lists together is very fast. You just take list A, and you stick list B at the end of it. So that could be very, very efficient, depending especially on what kind of list you have. Maybe it's just a matter of adjusting a pointer if it's a linked list. But for maps and sets, there could be more overhead. Let's now talk about the structure and functionality of concurrent collectors. So the difference between a concurrent and a non-concurrent collector is a concurrent collector will collect into a single mutable result container. And it'll accumulate the elements from all the threads that are running in the common fork joint pool into one and only one mutable result container. Now, the same process takes place. The input's partitioned into chunks by splitterators. That's the same. Each chunk runs in parallel in the common fork join pool. That's the same. Here's where things get interesting. The chunk subresults are collected together into one mutable result container, which needs to be concurrency aware or thread safe. And of course, the reason for that is all these different threads are running and accumulating into one thing. So clearly, because this is going to be shared by the different threads, whatever you use as that container must be prepared to properly handle shared mutable state because we're updating it. It's mutable. We're modifying it. It's, it's the very definition of mutable. The nice thing about this is that there's no need to merge intermediate subresults. So if you have various types of collectors that are sets or maps or things that take a while to merge, then this approach might be a win under the right circumstances. The downside, of course, is that encounter order is not preserved. And 
you need to make sure that whatever you're using as your one and only immutable result container is thread safe. Now, when will you see a difference? So a concurrent collector may very well outperform a non-concurrent collector under certain assumptions if the merging costs are higher than the synchronization costs. And that has to do with all kinds of factors like how many threads do you have, what's your memory hierarchy, how long does it take to synchronize things across multiple cores, is that expensive or not. So there is no one, one size fits all answer to these things, but it's very cool and we'll take a look at an example that will make it clear how this works. If you have highly optimized result containers that are really designed to work efficiently in multi-threaded programs like concurrent hash maps, that may very well be faster than merging hash maps together. And we'll take a look at an example. So a hash map, as you probably know, has some fixed array that's used as the hash table, and then you hash into one of the elements, and then it goes ahead and has a collision resolution scheme, either a linked list or a balanced tree. A concurrent hash map has more or less the same data structure, but its locking strategy is vastly different, especially because hash map has no locking strategy. So you'd have to lock it with a single lock, which would be incredibly inefficient. And instead, concurrent hash map has essentially a lock per hash table array entry. And it uses compare and swap operations and spin locks and all kinds of other clever things like compare and swap type of operations. We won't go into how it works, but you can read about it here if you're interested in knowing the differences between these different approaches. There's also another legacy synchronized map that has been around in Java for a long time, but I strongly recommend using it. I strongly recommend against using it, <laughs> sorry, because it only has a single lock, and therefore the contention will be much higher than for concurrent hash map, which has separate locks for each of the different buckets that it's got in the hash table. Okay, so that was a quick tour, quick overview of the structure and functionality differences between non-concurrent and concurrent collectors. The most important thing to remember is concurrent collectors only have one mutable result container, which must be thread safe and synchronized and so on.